High in the Utztal Alps, at 3,210 meters elevation, the ice preserved something extraordinary for 5,300 years. A body and an entire Copper Age life frozen in time, complete with clothing, tools, weapons, and the meals still digesting in his stomach. When German tourists stumbled upon what they thought was a dead mountaineer in 1991, they had no idea they'd discovered Europe's oldest natural mummy. But Atzi the Iceman would reveal how our ancestors dressed and what they ate, and more. His body would expose the brutal reality of prehistoric existence, the diseases that ravaged them, the violence that surrounded them, and the sophisticated medical knowledge they developed to survive in a world where death came early and often. The September 19, 1991 discovery began with Erica and Helmut Simon hiking near the Similon Mountain Refuge. The corpse protruding from the glacier looked fresh enough to be recent. Austrian police arrived with pickaxes. Italian carabinieri followed. They hacked at the ice prison, assuming standard mountain rescue protocols. Bad weather turned the recovery into a multi-day ordeal. The body was so embedded that freeing it required destroying much of the surrounding ice, and with it, crucial archaeological context. Only when mountaineer Reinhold Messner saw a sketch of the unusual axe did anyone suspect the body's true age. Archaeologist Conrad Spindler examined the copper-bladed tool and declared the corpse at least 4,000 years old. Radiocarbon dating would later refine this to 5,300 years, the Copper Age, when metal tools were just beginning to transform European societies. The preservation itself was a geographic miracle. Utzi had fallen into a narrow, rocky gully, just 3 by 7 meters, that sheltered him from the glacier's grinding movement above. A warm foon wind had partially desiccated the corpse immediately after death. Then snow fell, and freezing ice encased everything, creating what scientists call a wet mummy, different from Egyptian mummies dried by desert heat, or bog bodies preserved by acidic peat. Scientists rushed the frozen corpse to a cold cell mimicking glacier conditions. Decomposition had already begun during the chaotic recovery. Every hour at above freezing temperatures destroyed irreplaceable evidence. The rush to preserve him was a race against time, 5,300 years of perfect preservation nearly undone by a few days of improper handling. For a full decade after discovery, researchers believed Utzi had died from exposure. The high altitude, his age, the harsh alpine environment, it seemed like a straightforward case of prehistoric misadventure. A traitor or shepherd caught in bad weather, freezing to death far from home. His remarkable preservation was just fortunate accident, they thought. A random glimpse into everyday Copper Age life. The 2001 X-ray changed everything. A small flint arrowhead, barely larger than a thumbnail, was lodged beneath his left shoulder blade. The discovery transformed an anthropological curiosity into a murder investigation. This wasn't death by misadventure. Someone had killed him. Advanced CT scanning in 2005 revealed the arrow's devastating path. It had pierced the subclavian artery, a major blood vessel running beneath the collarbone. The wound would have caused massive internal hemorrhaging. Blood would have filled his chest cavity within minutes. The trajectory analysis showed the arrow entered from behind and below, fired from approximately 30 meters distance. The angle suggested his killer stood downhill when they released the shot. The arrowhead remained embedded rather than passing through, confirmation of a long-distance shot that had just enough force to penetrate flesh and nick the artery before lodging against bone. Someone had tracked Utzi into the high mountains, waited for the perfect moment, and fired with lethal precision. The fact that they never retrieved their arrow suggested either they couldn't reach the body or something drove them away. The arrow wasn't Atsi's first violent encounter in his final days. His right hand bore a deep defensive wound, the kind that occurs when someone grabs a blade to prevent being stabbed. The cut went to the bone, so severe it would have partially paralyzed his fingers. Forensic analysis of the wound's healing showed it occurred one to two days before death. He'd been in close combat with a knife or hatchet and survived, at least temporarily. His skull revealed another layer of violence, Blunt force trauma with accompanying brain hemorrhage. Blood had pooled in the back of his brain, an injury that could have been independently fatal. The fracture pattern was consistent with either a deliberate blow from a weapon or a hard fall onto rocky ground. Combined with the arrow wound and defensive injury, it painted a picture of sustained conflict rather than a single ambush. Healed rib fractures from years earlier showed this wasn't unusual. 
The bones had mended completely, indicating injuries sustained long before his death. For Copper Age Europeans, violence was common and woven into the fabric of existence. Conflicts over resources, territory, or status could erupt without warning. Utsi's body was a map of these encounters, each scar and break documenting another survived battle until the final one he didn't. Analysis of his stomach contents added a chilling detail to his last day. He'd consumed a hearty meal of red deer and ibex meat, along with einkorn wheat, roughly 30 to 120 minutes before dying. The food remained undigested, suggesting he'd been ambushed while resting after eating. He wasn't fleeing when the arrow struck. He was taking a break, perhaps feeling safe at that extreme altitude when death found him. At approximately 46 years old, Utzi was elderly by Copper Age standards. Life expectancy in prehistoric Europe rarely exceeded 35 years. Those who survived childhood diseases, accidents, and violence still faced the slow degradation of their bodies. Utzi's skeleton revealed extensive wear, osteochondrosis in his spine, spondylosis in his lumbar region, significant arthritis in his knees and ankles. Every movement would have involved pain. The steep alpine terrain he traversed in his final days must have been excruciating even before the violence began. The most remarkable medical discovery came from DNA analysis of his hip bone tissue. Scientists found Borrelia burgdorferi, the bacteria causing Lyme disease. This made Utzi the oldest documented case in human history. Without antibiotics, the infection would have progressed through predictable stages, initial rash and fever, then joint pain and swelling, eventually neurological symptoms including facial paralysis, memory problems, and heart irregularities. The disease was slowly destroying his nervous system from within. His genome revealed additional health burdens. Despite his physically demanding lifestyle, isotope analysis showed he regularly traveled 60 kilometers from his home valley. He carried genetic markers for cardiovascular disease. His arteries were likely already showing signs of atherosclerosis, the hardening that leads to heart attacks and strokes. He was lactose intolerant in an era when dairy farming was spreading across Europe, limiting his dietary options. The 2023 genetic analysis also confirmed complete male pattern baldness, overturning earlier reconstructions that showed him with long hair. Parasitological examination found whipworm eggs in his colon, intestinal parasites that would have caused chronic abdominal pain and diarrhea. Combined with Lyme disease, arthritis, and cardiovascular issues, Utzi's body was failing on multiple fronts. The mountains that killed him might have seemed like escape from an increasingly unbearable existence. Even without the arrow, disease would have claimed him within a few years at most. 61 tattoos covered Utzi's weathered skin, created by rubbing charcoal into small incisions. These weren't random decorations or tribal identifiers. The tattoos formed a precise map of his pain, clustered exactly where his joints showed the most degeneration. Groups of parallel lines marked his lower back where his spine was deteriorating. More lines crossed his arthritic knees and ankles. Short perpendicular strokes targeted his painful wrists. The correlation between tattoo placement and diagnosed conditions was too exact for coincidence. Someone, perhaps Utzi himself, more likely a specialized healer, understood his body's pain points with remarkable precision. The technique resembles acupuncture meridians documented in Chinese medicine, though Utzi's tattoos predate the earliest known Chinese examples by 2,000 years. This suggests parallel development of therapeutic skin stimulation across ancient cultures, or perhaps knowledge networks we haven't yet discovered. His medical supplies confirm sophisticated pharmaceutical understanding. He carried two types of bracket fungus, Foams fomentarius, for starting fires, and Piptoporus betulinus, which has antibiotic and antiparasitic properties. His last meals included bracken fern, toxic if consumed in large quantities, but used in small doses to treat intestinal parasites. It drew on empirical knowledge developed through generations of observation, and did not rely on superstition. One tattoo cluster near his chest didn't correspond to any detected ailment, challenging the purely therapeutic theory. Perhaps it treated a soft tissue condition that left no skeletal evidence, heart problems from his cardiovascular disease, or respiratory issues from repeated lung infections. Or this single tattoo might have been decorative, a personal mark amid the medical map. The ambiguity reminds us that even the best preserved prehistoric body can't answer every question about how our ancestors understood their own suffering. The scientific community remains split on what actually killed Utzi. 
The mainstream theory, supported by the 2005 CT scan analysis, holds that the arrow severed his subclavian artery, causing rapid death from blood loss. The undigested food, the apparent ambush, the body position, everything points to sudden, violent death within minutes of being shot. But anthropologist Frank Ruley's team reached different conclusions using newer imaging technology. Their analysis showed the arrowhead penetrated only superficially, causing perhaps 100 milliliters of blood loss. Painful, but not fatal. They argue the head trauma came from falling after being wounded, not from a deliberate blow. In their reconstruction, Utsi survived the arrow wound, struggled on despite his injuries, and ultimately succumbed to hypothermia at 3,200 meters altitude, where temperatures drop below freezing, even in summer. Both theories have compelling evidence. The arterial damage is visible in some scans, but not others, possibly due to different imaging angles or decomposition artifacts. The head wound's cause, weapon, or fall can't be definitively determined from fracture patterns alone. The undigested meal fits either scenario, sudden death preventing digestion, or extreme cold shutting down digestive processes as the body conserved energy for survival. This scientific disagreement, three decades after discovery, illustrates a fundamental challenge in studying ancient remains. We can see the injuries, but not the sequence. We can measure the wounds, but not the time between them. Even with the best preserved prehistoric body ever found, certainty remains elusive. Utzi died violently, that much is clear. Whether violence or environment delivered the final blow may never be resolved. The 2012 genetic analysis seemed definitive. An international team sequenced Utzi's genome and announced he descended from Pontic Caspian steppe populations. Museums commissioned new reconstructions, showing light skin and flowing brown hair. Scientific papers were published. Documentaries were filmed. The genetic history of Europe seemed clearer with Utzi as a data point. Eleven years later, everything changed. A new team discovered the original sample was contaminated with modern DNA, possibly from researchers who'd handled the body. The clean 2023 analysis revealed completely different ancestry. Utzi descended almost entirely from Anatolian farmers who'd migrated to Europe generations earlier, with virtually no steppe ancestry. His skin was dark, not light. He was completely bald on top not merely balding. Every reconstruction was wrong. Every genetic conclusion overturned. This dramatic reversal exposed how fragile our understanding of the past remains. The 2012 team used the best available technology and followed standard protocols. They worked with contaminated samples no one realized were compromised. Isotope analysis of his teeth and bones proved more reliable, but still required careful interpretation. Strontium and oxygen isotopes in his tooth enamel, formed during childhood, matched valleys south of where he died. His bones, constantly remodeling throughout adulthood, showed he spent his later years within 60 kilometers of his childhood home. He wasn't a long-distance trader crossing the Alps, but a local who knew these mountains intimately. Yet even these chemical signatures depend on assumptions about ancient water sources and dietary patterns that could be mistaken. Pollen analysis added temporal precision but raised new questions. Hornbeam pollen in his gut indicated he traveled through lower altitude forests hours before death. Hop hornbeam pollen showed passage through middle elevations. Pine and spruce pollen marked his final ascent above the tree line. This botanical clock revealed he died in late spring or early summer when these plants were flowering. But why was he making this dangerous journey at the worst possible time, when snow still blocked passes and avalanches threatened every slope? Every element that preserved Utzi was a consequence of violence. The arrow that killed him positioned his body in the protective gully. The remote location that made him vulnerable to ambush also placed him beyond the reach of scavengers. The killers who left him with his valuable possessions, including the prestigious copper axe, ensured the integrity of the archaeological assemblage. If any single factor had been different, we would have nothing. Peaceful death would have meant proper burial or cremation according to Copper Age customs. His body would have decomposed, his possessions scattered or inherited. The organic materials, leather, wood, grass, would have rotted within years. Only the copper axe might have survived, context less in some museum collection, its owner forever anonymous. The copper axe itself embodies this paradox. Its presence marks Utzi as elite. Copper was valuable, weapons prestigious, the combination marking high status. This very status may have motivated his murder. 
yet his killers abandoned it, either unable to reach the body or frightened away by something. The weapon that might have caused his death became the artifact that revealed his true age to Reinhold Messner. The status symbol that made him a target made him recognizable as ancient rather than modern. His preservation required death under exact, specific conditions. The gully had to be narrow enough to protect from glacial movement, but not so deep that snow wouldn't cover him. The temperature had to be cold enough to prevent decay, but not so cold that freeze-thaw cycles destroyed tissue. The altitude had to be high enough for permanent ice, but low enough that he could reach it while wounded. Every variable aligned perfectly to create this singular window into the Copper Age. Climate change now threatens what violence preserved. The glacier that protected Utzi for five millennia is melting. Since 1991, dozens more bodies have emerged from alpine ice, most too degraded for meaningful analysis. Each represents a life as complex as Utzi's, a story we'll never know. His discovery came at the exact moment when technology could study him, but before climate change destroyed him. Another decade earlier, and we wouldn't have had the tools. Another decade later, and there might have been nothing left to find. The tourists who found Utzi thought they'd stumbled upon a mountaineering accident. Instead, they'd discovered a man who embodied the entire human experience of the Copper Age, the diseases that plagued them, the violence that surrounded them, the mountains they called home, and the medical knowledge they developed to survive it all. His body tells us that 5,300 years ago, people suffered from the same cardiovascular disease and infections we face today. They killed each other with careful precision. They understood pain well enough to map it on their skin and carried medicines to treat what they could. But perhaps the most profound lesson from Utzi isn't what we've learned. It's how wrong we keep getting it. The peaceful death theory lasted a decade. The genetic analysis was completely false for 11 years. Today's competing theories about his death might both be incorrect. We've studied him with the most advanced technology available, and we still can't agree on basic facts about how he died or who he was. This isn't failure, it's the reality of studying deep prehistory. Every body that emerges from melting ice, every new technology we develop, every reanalysis of old data reminds us that our understanding is provisional. Utzi forces us to confront the humbling truth that even the best preserved evidence from the past is interpreted through the lens of our present, with all its limitations and assumptions. The Copper Age wasn't a simple time of primitive people slowly discovering civilization. It was an era of complex medical knowledge, sophisticated tools, vast trade networks, and, yes, calculated murder in remote places. Utzi shows us our ancestors were fully human in all the complicated, brilliant, and brutal ways we recognize today. His frozen body is a mirror held up across five millennia, reflecting how remarkably similar we've always been.